Okay, here we are, May 7, 2021, Gruden Guitars, and another day with discussion of vintage guitars, question and answer. I'd like to start with a uh, discussion with Joe Spann, who works with me on appraisals. Uh, there's a lot of times when some things that seem like very straightforward questions turn out to be much less so than one might think. And one of the commonest questions, of course, would be what model do I have and what year is it? And of course, what is it worth? And on an appraisal, an appraisal is really much more than simply a statement of how much it's worth. Uh, we want to know a real history of the instrument. We go over it with care. But one of the obvious things is just to figure out make, model, and date. Date can be quite a complex question in the case of Gibson, Fender, and some others. With Martin, it's relatively straightforward. If it was made from 1898 onward, it has a serial number on the neck block. Those numbers were assigned when the guitar was not yet complete. Uh, at the point of serial numbering, the specs were basically cast in stone, but the instrument was just a set of bent sides neck block and end block and the neck block was stamped with the model designation and the serial number the serial number started with martin's on the neck block in 1898 but they actually didn't put the model designation on the neck block until late in 1931 but it's still such that with a serial number martin has wonderfully accurate records. And if you provide them with a number, they can tell you the exact date that the instrument was started. And furthermore, they can go back and tell you uh, when it was completed. They have records when it was shipped, who it, which dealer it was shipped to. And in many cases, if it came back for any warranty work, they even have records of that, but their records are remarkably complete. With Gibson, it's a whole other story. And since Joe Spann has spent well over 40 years researching Gibson history, I'll let Joe start to talk now about how does he date a Gibson? And Gibson serial numbers are not as simple as Martin. Martin serial numbers can fit on the back of my business card for 1898 to the present. But Gibson serial numbers hop, skip, jump, repeat, and they have different serial numbers for different series of instruments over different periods of time. So here's Joe, let's let him talk about some of that. Hey, good morning, all of you out there. Um, Gibson, as George has alluded to, is a much more complex situation when we're trying to determine a production date. And uh, also we make a, a distinction between the production date and the shipping date. Uh, for Gibson, sometimes it's, possible to tell the difference uh, in those two items. Gibson at the factory, uh, their production accounting department used a system of tracking called order numbers. And uh, we refer to them today as factory order numbers or FON for short FONs. Gibson used, uh, the production accounting department used those factory order numbers to track the cost of everything not just instruments. So for instance, if they sent somebody down the street to the hardware store to buy some tooling, or if a, a shipment of lumber came in, or maybe some tailpieces and tuners from Grover, each of those was assigned a factory order number. So it's important to know that not every factory order number at Gibson refers to a batch of instruments, not at all. Uh, so it could be anything uh, attached to uh, a cost. So um, that's the first thing to know, that those factory order numbers 
are not all attached to instruments, but sometimes refer to other costs. Gibson sometimes uh, die stamped, sometimes ink stamped, and sometimes hand wrote the factory order numbers on uh, the instruments as they moved along the production process. And some of them, they didn't do any of that at all. So some of the less expensive instruments don't have any kind of a number, be it a factory order number or a serial number or anything else. Uh, but I think the important point to, to gather here is that factory order number was attached to the instrument while it was in production. Now, after, after instruments at Gibson moved through production, uh, that means that they were uh, uh, put together basically and bound and sanded and then went to staining and finishing. Uh, they were stored on the third floor uh, and the hardware, the metal hardware, the tuners, the bridges, the tail pieces, uh, in the case of banjos, all the metal work in the banjos uh, was not assembled until they were ready to ship. So, uh, and the serial numbers were not assigned until that time. Uh, for the most part, uh, Daryl Wolf, uh, the great Gibson F5 mandolin scholar, he and I have a continuing discussion about that. Uh, and we, Daryl, we'd love to have you here sometime and we could talk about that during the program. Uh, but for the most part, the serial numbers were then not assigned until they were ready to assemble the thing and ship it. Uh, and that's based on documentary evidence uh, from Gibson factory uh, internal documents of the time. And the reason for that was because all those sub-assemblies, things like tail pieces and uh, bridges and tuners were expensive. And uh, they didn't assemble those onto the instruments until they were absolutely sure they were ready to go. So you can see uh, how that a factory order number and a serial number at Gibson are very, very different things and indicate two different things. One of them, uh, the factory order number is date of production and the serial number is the date that it was first ready to ship in most cases. Um, now, what about those instruments that I mentioned that don't have any factory order numbers? Hmm, how do we tell when they were made? And I actually, it gets a little more complicated than that because Gibson reused factory order numbers almost every year. So something that was from batch 100 in uh, 1931 uh, was something entirely different that was in batch 100 in 1932. Uh, the accountants rolled those numbers over, when, actually whenever they got ready to, but in later years, it, it happened in the 30s. It, it began to happen every year. They, they reused the numbers, the factory order numbers. So, uh, so that can be confusing. Uh, a factory order number by itself is not enough to give a production date. The serial numbering system uh, changed many times, not just in the pre-war period, but also in, in the 1950s and 60s, the 70s, the 80s. It's changed a number of times. So a factory order number, a serial number is just not enough to give a, a good production date for a Gibson instrument. Uh, it takes those two things, hopefully we have those, and also a, an examination of the instrument uh, for its constructional uh, features. Uh, we know, uh, because we've studied, we know exactly when certain kinds of tuners were available for use, and tail pieces and bridges and, and other things, when the the adjustable truss rod was first used, things like that. We have good hard dates for those uh, that are documented. Uh, so, uh, you know, assuming that the instrument is reasonably original uh, as far as tuners and, and hardware and things and, and appointments, uh, that also gives us a clue. Uh, we're bringing that information in from catalogs, from dealer price lists, uh, from internal factory documents, uh, a lot of things that are not generally available to the public. Uh, you can't go on the internet and find these documents and, and it's not in a book somewhere. Uh, uh, these kinds of documents are, are in private hands. Uh, I, I own a, a collection. Uh, there's a collection here at Groom Guitars in the archives. George has a wonderful library, a wonderful archive here of, of original documents and things, uh, not just for Gibson, but, but lots of manufacturers. And as appraisers, we use that every day uh, to help us understand. Um, so 
the factory order number, if it's there, the serial number, if it's there, and the appointments of the instruments are all very important when we're talking about uh, trying to find a date for a Gibson, a production date or a shipping date. Um, other things that we have, other documents, of course, are the shipping ledgers themselves. Gibson uh, did have clerks in the shipping department that kept ledgers, uh, and we're uh, happy to be able to have access to copies of some of those. Uh, they're not indexed, and so as you might imagine, uh, over the course of a year, they would use about 500 pages in a ledger like that. So. Uh, it's difficult, <laughs> it's time consuming to find original shipping information for uh, Gibson instruments, but sometimes we're lucky. Uh, another thing that, happens, uh, that we have to deal with, some instruments at Gibson were picked up at the factory. And that means they weren't shipped. And that means they're not in the shipping ledgers. So uh, very occasionally we run into those kinds of situations. So uh, again, factory owner numbers, serial numbers, and appointments. Now, it's still even a little bit more complex than that. Uh, and I'm going to use banjos as an example, uh, but I could easily use guitars or mandolins. When banjos ran through the production system at Gibson, uh, they produced the rim and the resonator and the neck. And they kept those three pieces together, the three wooden pieces, and they all have the same factory order number identified on them. Uh, they rolled through the factory in these big rolling racks that had 40 bins. Um, and then when they came out of the finishing department, they were stored just like that. They didn't put the metal hardware on right away. They didn't put the tail pieces and the bridges and the tuners and the strings uh, for the reasons that I've already talked about. Uh, those those sub-assemblies that Gibson purchased from other suppliers were expensive. And if the instrument wasn't going to ship right away, they didn't use it uh, because they wanted to, to hold those things back for items that they were going to ship right away. So it's very possible, and we see this uh, on continuously all the time, for an instrument, say, to have been produced in 1929 or 1930 and then not finally assembled and shipped until much later, say 1934 or 1935. There can be multiple years difference between the uh, moment in time when it arrived from finishing and the point in time in which uh, the assembly department put it together and shipped it out. Uh, so how do we handle those situations? Well, that's experience also. Uh, we know, again, when certain fixtures were available, certain tuners from Grover, from Cluson, uh, from Elton, certain things when they were available. So if we have a, for instance, a Gibson banjo come in that has a factory order number that dates to 1929, but the metalwork is nice and clean and it's got say a Cluson tailpiece on it or Cluson tuners and they appear, all this appears to be original, then we know that the banjo was delayed in production. Uh, they just didn't have an order for it right away. And so it got held uh, and wasn't assembled to a later time. And I use banjo as an example there, but we could say the same thing about guitars and mandolins. Um, and also uh, another thing that makes it even more complex is uh, Gibson ordered parts, so those sub-assemblies like tuners and tailpieces and things, and they held them in the, uh, in the storeroom on the second floor. And when they got low, they ordered again. And if they didn't order the exact same part, the exact same tuner or tailpiece or whatever, uh, the old parts got shoved to the bottom and the new parts got put on top. And so Gibson would use up those newer parts until they ran out. And then sometimes you would see an older kind of tuners or tailpiece or whatever used on a, on a banjo or a mandolin or a guitar. So Gibson is a very complex situation, not anywhere near as straightforward as Martin. Uh, again, in summary, we look at factory order numbers, we look at serial numbers, and we look at uh, constructional features to try and come to a consensus uh, about when an instrument was made. So. Now, interestingly enough, uh, with Fender, we have even less information available uh, because with Fender, the serial number plates for the neck fastening plates were stamped in quantity and then thrown in a box and used in a virtually grab bag manner. The serial numbers were used by Fender to keep track of warranty but 
they're not strictly consecutive. And so, you know, with early fenders, you have uh, an inspection tape. On the inside, right, on the tape. body cavity. But that, that doesn't, you know, that, that's only uh, in the 50s. That's right, early on. And uh, by, even by the late 50s, that's not there. Right. So Fender is, is particularly difficult. Um, it's, it's interesting. Um, the records for Fender uh, during the time that Leo owned the company, uh, to my knowledge, have never been found. Uh, either Leo kept them when he sold to CBS or they were turned over to CBS and they may be sitting in a storehouse somewhere <laughs> at Columbia CBS, Broadcasting. They were not that interested in history. <laughs> right, exactly. At that point in time, nobody thought about yeah, that. No, they, they did date the necks right. and they dated the bodies. Right. But that's not the date of final assembly. No, this is the same situation that I was just talking about uh, at Gibson. Uh, and and it, it Fender, uh, a Fender instrument, a pre-CBS Fender instrument is uh, the most difficult thing that we do really in so many aspects. Leo designed his instruments so that they could be easily repaired, hopefully uh, stripped down in the field and repaired by somebody uh, at a music store. The flip side of that is that they're easily disassembled and changed and parts replaced. Replacement parts have been available for quite a long time. So uh, it takes real careful examination and lots of knowledge, original examples, to know whether a fender, a pre-CBS fender is correct or not. It's, it's a real problem. Yeah, and they're built like an erector set. So you can have parto casters no, oh, absolutely. They have right. parts of half a dozen instruments. Uh, you could see a Telecaster neck on a Stratocaster body. Uh, they will interchange. They're the same scale length and they'll fit. That's but right. uh, it doesn't mean that they came from the factory that way. Right. And you see lots of Esquires that have been converted to look like a Telecaster. Uh, it just goes on and on with all of the problems in that regard. Um, custom color finishes are a, another issue that we deal with quite a bit. Um, you know, it, uh, there's, no, there's no book we can do, go to. There's no original documents from Fender that we can go to and say, oh yes, serial number 59189 was a custom order. It was something that somebody custom ordered in Candy Apple Red. There isn't any such thing for us to look at. It takes knowledge of the materials and the way that the finish was applied uh, in order to determine originality uh, or to, to render an opinion, I guess I should say, about originality. Uh, because in the end, we weren't there, were we, George? I'm afraid not. No. Although when I started out in 1970, uh, at that time, or even when I started collecting 1963, um, we knew in 63 that a herringbone D28, oh, that was a venerable vintage instrument. That was an antique type thing. Right. Um, let me get through one more. I don't know. Okay. I'm going to step out for a minute, leave you with George. You're in good hands. I can use you again. Um, anyway, we knew in the case of old Martins and other instruments, that these were venerable vintage instruments. And we treated them as though they were virtually antique. But the fact is, in 1965, a 30-year-old instrument was 1935. And uh, you know, that's the age now of a 19... 95 instrument and uh but back then you know i was you know, a college student and uh, even when i opened up the store i was 24 years old but the instruments that were made in the 1930s were nowhere near as old as they are today but frankly many of them needed a lot of work because they were pretty beat in many cases, people didn't take very good care of them. But today, 
it's increasingly hard to find unmolested, truly fine vintage instruments that have not been reworked in ways that really compromise their integrity as a collectible. But those that are in fine original condition are still very highly sought after right now. So that is a consideration that you know, markets change. And today we are in a position where increasingly not only growing guitars, but dealers in general are having a real struggle finding enough vintage pieces uh, that are truly unmolested. The whole term vintage already, as I've said in previous times, uh, is becoming something of an issue where I'd like to almost change it to the point where we discuss new, used, and collectible golden era pieces. Uh, golden era, though, for different companies and even for different types of instruments is different. Like for Gibson, their golden era for mandolins was in the early to late 1920s. Uh, for their banjos, it was primarily 1929 through about 1941. Uh, for their electric guitars, it's primarily from 19. 49 through about 1965, mid-year after that, they're much less sought after. But the point is, there's not just one golden era, it's for different companies have different particular golden era pieces, periods, and for different pieces within their model lineup, there may be different golden era periods. A company like Martin, has been around since 1833. Uh, that's plenty of time for them to have several different periods that are sort of collectible. And for Gibson, uh, they've been, Orville Gibson started in the 1890s. Uh, and his stuff is highly collectible, although not the greatest to play. They're interesting museum pieces, uh, but I think, Joe, you would agree that Gibson had different golden eras for different items. Right. And, and I think, uh, George, that you've made the point uh, many times that uh, golden era is not just a set period of time for every manufacturer. Uh, it's a, a specific time for each manufacturer. Yes. And even within that, Gibson mandolins have one period, Gibson banjos have another. Absolutely. Gibson flat top guitars, my favorite ones are in basically about 1929 through 42. Right. Uh, but uh, for electrics, it would really be primarily in about 1949 through about 1964. Right. But exactly. Getting into early 65, or actually you could get as far as mid 65 when but about the time that the Firebird went from reverse body to non-reverse, and about the same time that uh, Gibson put trapeze tail pieces on AS 335s rather than the stop tail piece, which was about the same time. About the same time, sixty-five. Right. Um, nut width changes. Yeah, nut width changes. But basically, when Ted McCarty was there, the electrics were great. Shortly after he left, things degraded pretty quickly. It didn't degrade immediately upon his departure, but within a few months, it did. Right. So golden era can be uh, many different things. Different to periods for different makers. Exactly. And uh, within the same maker, if a maker has been in business for over 100 years, uh, there can be several golden eras for different type instruments within that company. But... Um, the fact is the guys who built the wonderful Martins uh, during the period of C.F. Martin Sr., uh, you know, where we're going back in the 1830s through the 18, into the 1860s, uh, that's one period that they're marvelous instruments, but they're not modern style steel string guitars but they're highly collectible and beautifully crafted. And the craftsmanship continued to be just absolutely wonderful, except that they weren't really doing steel string guitars until the 1920s. And uh, 
the ones that are the most sought after by a lot of players today is utility instruments they're going to play as well as collect would be mostly from about 1927 through late 1938 when their forward shifted scallop bracing but they still made some great guitars afterward and frankly some of the best guitars martin's made in my lifetime are being made right now i wanted to make that point i'm glad you brought it up because in my opinion some of the new martin guitars that we have right here right now are some of the best i've ever seen uh and and that's no that's no exaggeration um the sinker mahogany martins that we sell the new line of uh, of 28 style 28s with the addy tops my goodness the workmanship and the sound is just superior i think that people in the future will look back on where we are right now uh the years of COVID, uh, as a golden era by the way if anybody has questions to submit we didn't get a whole lot sent in today so send them in because if you send questions i'll still try to get to them today uh we do have a question here um uh, that came in uh John asks, which Martin models from the 1930s golden age period are your favorite and best sounding? D45s are the most valuable with the best materials reserved for them. The D28s are the holy grail for bluegrass players, partly from Clarence White influence, followed by uh, D18s. Well, uh, I, I would differ in some ways from what's said there. I mean, it, it didn't take Clarence White to make D28 sort of the standard. Uh, D28 was a standard in Bill Monroe's Bluegrass Boys pretty well from the start. And uh, that's before Clarence was known at all. Well, it, yes, absolutely. But even before that, in the early days of country music, George, how many string bands in North Carolina and Tennessee uh, had a D18 or a D28? Plenty uh, of them, although the, the big sales for D28s really are post-war. Right. It took a while for the D to catch on, and the D45 certainly is the one that right now brings the most money. But uh, is the D45 a better guitar than a triple O45 or double O45 or a single O45? The answer is this, the workmanship's the same. The materials are the same. The ornamentation is equally good on all of them. And if you're a finger picker, if you're a blues player, a D45 may be very valuable, but it's not really the best blues guitar. I'd, uh, if I were a blues guy, I'd rather have a triple O45 to play. Absolutely. And for that matter, lots of blues players like Gibson's better anyway. But uh, <laughs> when it comes right down to it, blues players sometimes like a funky sounding instrument. They don't necessarily right. want smooth and mellow. Right. But D45s are extremely rare with only 91 pre wars made and uh, they bring a lot of money. But uh, is it inherently a better guitar than a triple O? No, it's just a different guitar. And we have customers, in fact, within the past year, I've had some customers who could easily have afforded any D45 in the world. As far as if it was for sale, they could have afforded it. They had the money, but they'd rather have a triple O. And uh, so far as my own personal playing, I'm just as happy on a triple O as I am on a D. And uh, triple O 45s are almost as rare as a D 45. And they didn't used to bring as much as they do now, but right now, a good triple O 45, uh, they're bringing record prices right now. Um, some things were bid up into a market bubble from 2002 through 2007. Uh, but uh, a lot of it crashed in 2008, but really I was well aware that the market was stagnating so far as the financial situation in 2007. By mid-year, things were slowing down dramatically and that bubble was popping. But the point is today, we have lots of folks very interested in fine condition, collectible, golden age pieces rather than i'll say golden age rather than vintage, vintage. <laughs> and for jimmy de Quisto, he died in 1995 and some of his most valuable are the ones made late in his life for any individual booth here 
some of their absolute best stuff is their last stuff. Sure. Absolutely. Unless they were getting Alzheimer's or too arthritic to work. But if they were still creative, they were great. And, and Stradivari lived to be 94 years old and died in 1737. And some of his finest instruments were made when he was as old as 75 or 80 years old. And there are, still are, there's an example of one made in, when he was in, it, it's right on the label, a handwritten label in my 93rd year. So he was very proud of being 93 and still making instruments. But the answer basically though, to my favorite guitars for Martin are, you know, I like OMs, triple O's, double O's, they're all highly regarded. And every one of those in a style 45 is just as good as the other, so far as quality. And for that matter, Martin's quality of workmanship was uniformly good. It didn't matter whether you bought a single, a single O18 or a D18, the workmanship was the same, but also the workmanship between a style 18 and a style 28 was also the same. Right. The, the materials were less expensive. The mahogany at that time cost less than Brazilian rosewood. So you paid less for a style 18. It had less ornamentation, but it didn't have lesser workmanship. And the bracing pattern was the same. And the type of wood for the top was Adirondack spruce on both, although they may have used a bit more a higher grade so far as how many lines per inch. But the fact is how many lines per inch on Adirondack does not necessarily mean good versus bad on tone. Uh, the quality of tone you can get with Adirondack, even with wide grain is remarkable. And it's very different from Sitka spruce. All right, now, before we leave this question, uh, George has answered your question about his favorite Martin, but uh, I think we'd be remiss if we passed over an opportunity for him to talk about his very favorite guitar of all. Well, I have a 1924 Lore signed L5 that I personally like, but it's not near as valuable financially no. at this point, the monetary terms you know, you could get more money for a good, clean, advanced jumbo Gibson, which cost much less new. Because uh, the AJ was what, $90? $90, new. Dollars, yeah. And uh, even in 1924, uh, the L5 was two seventy five, and the case was $25.50. But, uh, or you could get in banjos, uh, you know, an all-American banjo, and mid thirties was $550 for a raised head tenor and a RB 75 flathead five string was only $75. And the RB 75 in clean original condition, original five string flathead one piece flange would bring more money than the All-American. The All-American would be hard pressed to get more than $35,000. And the RB 75 would bring well over a hundred thousand dollars for a squeaky clean original one absolutely and and the point here which i think is a very important point is it's not always about which model it is a d45 or a triple lot 45 or an l5 uh, a lot of it it depends on you as a person uh you know maybe a, a triple lot 45 is just not your guitar and and so it doesn't matter what the price is you don't you're not interested well i've played some style 18 martins from the 30s that were marvelous sounding instruments okay. and uh so far as the quality of construction every bit as good as on a style 28 and uh, for that matter the, the quality of construction on a style 45 was not necessarily especially notably cleaner work. Martin had a very high standard of quality regardless of which quality grade it was. But what you paid for extra was more expensive wood, more ornamentation, uh, you know, like the carved volute on the back of the neck that was for styles 28 on up and the styles 17, 18, and 21 didn't have the car of volute in the 30s. Uh, and, but the design of the bridge was the same. The design of the bracing was the same. And from if you close your eyes and just listen, the quality of sound of some of those old D18s is absolutely remarkable. But it took a while sometimes for people to realize just how good they truly were. Because I remember back in the 60s, 
the common knowledge with bluegrass is is D28 is a whole lot better. And that's what was in Bill Monroe's band and D18s. It didn't matter what year it was, they were all worked the same. So that uh, they didn't value a 1930s Ford shifted scallop brace D18 any more than they did the 1960s or 1950s, which was kind of dumb uh, because these days, of course, a good mid thirties D18 can push 50 or $60,000. And uh, one from the fifties may push 75 or 8,000. Right. Uh, so and, if you had invested back then, you'd be looking yeah, well, good now. In, in, I remember in the sixties that nobody was willing to pay much over a hundred dollars to get any D18 used. But um, so far as, you know, one thing I can also, another question that we can both sort of address here, please explain how a Martin guitar neck is adjusted and set up for ease of playing compared to a guitar with a truss rod and tolerances of the strings to the neck and frets on each. Well, basically we're gonna to try to set them up to the same type tolerances, except that if it has a truss rod, it's a heck of a lot easier to tweak it. If you don't have a truss rod, sometimes you do the best you can with it. Right. But, um, I mean, there are techniques is, like this, heat setting and compression refretting and things. But, but heat setting often enough doesn't last. It doesn't last a long time. So you can, you can heat set, heat it, bend it a bit. But so far as is it going to really be stable and stay that way, I wouldn't count on it. Compression fretting, uh, we've talked about in previous discussions. That is a different matter. And, uh, but even on Gibson guitars, there are some Gibsons that don't have truss rods, which was basically any Gibson made prior to 1921 does not have a truss rod. That's correct. And the remarkable thing about a lot of those is that generally those necks have held up extraordinarily well. You don't see a lot of warped necks on many Gibsons, but when you do, it's a problem and it's probably going to end up being a plane and refret job. And, and one of the things I think it, uh, we should mention about those early necks that don't have truss rods that have not warped, uh, many of them are two piece necks and the grain is set against each other in the, uh, in the, in the neck. So that if, if the one piece wants to warp this way, the other piece counteracts it. Uh, and which they is, have a little center and have lamination. A center lamination. And it's not as good as a truss rod, but uh, it's not too bad an idea. Well, and Martin necks also, and many of the early ones have an ebony reinforcement bar uh, that um, the, the necks tend to be remarkably stable. Uh, remarkably so. And keep in mind also that the Martins had compression fretting prior to late 1934 when they had bar frets, but the Gibsons never did have bar frets. Right. So Gibson was not doing compression fretting the way Martin did. Uh, but you can still, on a Gibson that didn't have compression fretting, you can do that now uh, with graduated size frets, but still it's nowhere near equivalent to having a truss rod. But we, we try, generally to set them up with about the same tolerances with or without a truss rod. But uh, the other thing obviously is people think of truss rods as something to adjust action with when in fact they're really to adjust neck relief. Often if the action is bad, it's because the neck set angle is bad. From the beginning. And that is something that could be a factory flaw. Seldom that would get with Martin, but occasionally with Gibson, we'll see that it probably wasn't right the day it left. Uh, Right. And we probably should jump in right here too, George, and, and talk about the different kind of fret. You mentioned bar frets. And uh, today, most, uh, well, all, all modern guitars use a T fret when you look at it in profile. And some people think, and this was me included, that uh, bar frets are older. You know, the bar fret came first and then the T fret. And that's not true, is it? Uh, T frets have been around for a long, long time. Well, bar frets were there first, but it wasn't... Uh... T frets have been around since the early 1800s. Right. right. So uh, the point is that, yeah, they, the modern style T frets been there since before Martin even came to the USA. Right. Martin used bar frets because they've used compression fretting. Right. 
and it was not they were unaware of the modern style of fret, of fret. but you couldn't the, the compression fretting permitted them especially for guitars with gut strings to have a considerably stiffer neck and they could adjust warps with graduated size frets and they did have graduated sizes that they could use so if there's a little hump in one section they could have necks that, that had just needed this adjustment and they could have frets that were just ever so slightly different in width and they could use those for compression fretting so they could do it not just for the whole length of the neck, but for even specific parts of the fingerboard where it would be visually, virtually undetectable, but where it did have different degrees of compression fretting to keep that neck stiff. And often enough, if something came back for warranty work, if there was a little bit of warp, what they would do was take out the frets and use compression fretting to get it to straighten in order. Sure. And that's what Martin did. But after late 34, they were using the uh, modern frets and a T-bar in the neck. Um, we have uh, a question from Jeffrey Bullock. Cleveland Clinic staff emeritus, PhD. While I understand the general concept behind a compensated saddle, I do not understand why some appear to be designed differently. In the attached picture of a Blue Ridge saddle, it has a dip on the second string, while the 2017 Larave has a peak on the seventh, second string. The 1995 Martin D41, a high-end guitar by any account, has no compensation at all. Well. What we see here is, it's gonna be hard to see this in some of these pictures, but we can see the Blue Ridge and the Larave photos here. Um, the fact is that what you see on all of these is that there's actually a slight slant to the saddle and the base strings are a little longer in a graduated uh, manner with a high E having a slightly longer string length than the, uh, excuse me, the low E string has a slightly longer length than the, than the high. high E. And uh, the most difficult ones to intonate often are the second string, the B string on an acoustic and on an electric, the uh, unwound G and B are the hardest to get in tune. Uh, but and so much of this depends on the gauge of strings. You're exactly. Using. That's what I was going and to the interject. The type of strings right. you're using. The um, tuning of the instrument. Yeah, whether you, you know, various open tunings can be different. Uh, Is it different compensation? But uh, what uh, Jimmy DeCristo did, and uh, his, his had no compensation on the saddle. And uh, you can get quite remarkably good uh, with the right gauge strings on an acoustic instrument. Uh, you really don't need much compensation at all. And in fact, uh, DeQuisto's guitar is intonated quite well. I hadn't heard anybody belly aching much about the intonation on a DeQuisto and they had no compensation on the saddle. Right. Uh, but it was just a matter of having the right slant. And all tuning is a compromise, whether we're talking about a fretted instrument or a piano. Uh, uh, I guess the easiest way to say it is uh, a, a note is always not always the same note. A D note in the key of D major is uh, one vibration per second. And a D note in a G chord is a totally different note. Well, not totally different, it's a little different. Uh, and so, Everything is uh, is a compromise in tuning, whether it be a piano that's tuned or or a guitar. So as George says, uh, you can change the gauge of strings you use on your guitar and throw uh, throw the uh, intonation completely out, or or you could change the tuning. You could do a drop D tuning or 
uh, on open chord tuning, uh, the the most uh, the biggest culprit on an acoustic guitar, of course, is the second string. The open B note uh, is often a problem, which is why you see it uh, is the most often compensated uh, on a saddle on an acoustic guitar. But if you tuned your guitar in some standard way, it might not be the second string that was the problem. So it's always a compromise uh, intonation. You know. On a piano, they have a tempered scale, and that's how come you can play all keys on the same piano with the same tuning. But the fact is, if you tune it absolutely perfect pitch with no compensation for that tempered scale, then the piano will play perfectly in the key of C and in no other. Horribly in every other key. Yes. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> It's, if you're playing a bowed instrument, those have no frets. And if you're playing in a string quartet or in an orchestra, they have no frets and therefore they don't have to worry about a tempered scale. And that's right. And they make small adjustments all the time by ear, the good players But do. if they're playing with a piano accompanist, they actually have to compensate a little bit so they're not out of tune with, with the piano. piano. Right. If they're playing in a string quartet with no instruments that have a tempered scale, then they can play where they actually will finger differently so that uh, the, the, they compensate or they're not compensating if they're playing in a string quartet but their fingering is different in each key slightly. Exactly. And uh, it's barely noticeable to them, but they're playing by ear. They're just playing where it sounds right. Making small compensations. And uh, when they play with the piano, they can do that because they're playing by ear again and they're playing with the piano and they're playing the notes where it sounds right when they're doing the piano. So they're not having to necessarily really think it through they probably would have a hard time actually playing by ear without the piano accompaniment. I bet they'd have a hard time playing at the exact same fingering that they would do with the piano. They were just probably doing so. it by ear. Probably when they're playing so. with just other strings, they just automatically compensate because they're doing it by ear and what, what feels right. The differences are very small, but enough that it does matter. And guitars have a tempered scale. Uh, so uh, the fret scale is a tempered scale and it is not the same as if you had no frets. Um, we have uh, a couple of other things we could always chat about. One thing, we have a couple of Vince Gill's instruments. We actually have 10 of Vince Gill's instruments that are still available. We started out with 40. And there are two that I think are still deserving of attention. One, and see if Eric has any more questions, uh, is this LSL guitar, similar in specs to a Stratocaster so far as body shape, but not made by Fender. Slightly different peg head shape. And this is one that was made for Vince Gill. And that he played quite extensively on stage. It's a very good guitar. He did use it for some years as one of his primary stage guitars. And it is available at what I consider a good price at 6,000 because LSLs are expensive when new. And this one has memorabilia appeal, comes with a signed certificate from Vince, photo of Vince with the guitar. And there's plenty of pictures of him on stage using this guitar as it was one of his primary stage guitars. Another one is 1955 Telecaster. And this is one that is squeaky clean. There's a little bit of elbow wear on the back. And uh, that's basically the only wear it otherwise looks like new. In fact, uh, it looks new enough that uh, one potential buyer was uh, quite upset. He said that his tech said that it was refinished, which it isn't. 
they said that well, there were some sanding marks. Well, you know, by in 1954 and earlier, uh, they were hand sanded and they have very, very few sanding marks. But by 55, when this was made, they were block sanded. And occasionally you will see some sanding scratches, but it's, uh, it is absolutely factory spec. Also by 55, uh, they wired the assembly here in before putting it into the guitar and then just did the final soldering for hooking up the leads to the jack went in assembly. So the soldering for those two leads can look a little different from some of the soldering for the pots and the switch. So um, that may have confused somebody, but I can assure you that this guitar is absolutely original. And in fact, when Vince bought it, he got it from the family of the original owner. It still had the original strings on it and they wanted him to play a tune on it. And he said, well, like the first change the strings and they said oh but it has the original strings we wouldn't you wouldn't want to change that would you and he said uh, not to worry uh, you can keep the strings as a memento uh, but uh, the guitar is wonderfully original super clean has its original super clean case and is accompanied by a 1955 Fender Tweed Deluxe amp that was also bought new with the guitar. So the whole set is available and uh, it is priced at $50,000, but uh, it is beautiful, pristine. And again, letter signed from Vince and a photo of Vince with the guitar, great instrument. So anyway, um, I'd like to get Joe back for a moment. And uh, there's always uh, plenty more that we can discuss. Uh, but so far as there is no lack of more research that needs to be done. And it's an ongoing process. We are learning more virtually every day we learn something new. Uh, well, absolutely. And uh, we're not infallible either by any means. Uh, we certainly can make mistakes and uh, we're willing to learn from those mistakes and, and hopefully to do better in the future. Uh, and again, I'd like to emphasize part of what we do here is the fact that we've got a building full of people who've been handling and examining and, and working on these guitars now for decades. And it's very, very difficult to replace that kind of experience. Uh, a, a document from a factory won't give you that, a shipping ledger won't give you that. Uh, the, the experience of seeing the instruments and handling them, uh, looking at them is extremely valuable. Um, On the uh, other hand, a shipping ledger can give you things that no amount of experience handling and looking will tell you. Right. Uh, that uh, it just, for example, serial number lists that were published previously for Gibson were off by as much as four years in many cases. Correct. And I think it's worth a bit of explanation as how you came to discover some of that because there were numerous books, including my own, that was printed back in the 90s, uh, that the dates were wrong. But I was going by previously published Gibson listings uh, lists that were compiled actually by Gibson employees that the company used, but they right. were wrong. Right, uh, and and that uh, that correction that uh, came about as a result of my work had largely to do with looking at the Gibson system as a whole. Uh, and the first piece of that was understanding that factory order number system that I talked about earlier and understanding that the production accounting department used that to track costs of everything in the factory. 
uh, and there was not a separate sequence for acoustic guitars and one for banjos and one for mandolins and one for every time they went down to the hardware store and bought screws and nuts and bolts and tools. No, it's the same system of factory order numbers issued by the production accounting department to cover costing within the factory so that they could uh, follow that and account for it. So when we began, or when I began to put together uh, factory order numbers from guitars with the numbers from the banjos, with the numbers from the mandolins, it became quickly obvious that something was wrong. Uh, because uh, we knew, for example, that an L2 Gibson acoustic guitar, one with Argentine gray finish and gold sparkle edge binding, uh, was made only a very short period of time uh, in 1929, 1930. And if they had factory order numbers in the 9500, 9700, 9600 uh, series, uh, and, that, that's, and that system of factory order numbers was all the same, well, that meant the banjos with numbers in that in that range also were made in that same time period, 1929, 1930, 1934. Maybe before Earls was made in 34. Uh, and, and it simply wasn't. Uh, I think it was probably started around December of 29, and it was ready early in 1930. Uh, it may have shipped several times before it got sent over to North Carolina in 1934 to Graves Barbershop. Uh, and purchased over there by Fisher Henley. I mean, we know that's true. We know that Fisher Henley purchased it at Graves Barbershop in 1934. And um, you were also able to trace suppliers for things like the flange and the tailpiece and other components. Right. So you know even when those were made, which further corroborates that. Exactly right. So um, for instance, uh, the blueprint for the Gibson one piece flange is still in existence. Uh, and it shows uh, the date that the blueprint was drawn. Uh, all the subsequent changes to small dimensions on those flange castings. Uh, so when we see those flanges in real life, and we can see they're not all the same, there's small differences in dimension. And, and not only dimension, but the material. The quality of the, of the material. We know that they were made over different times, and we know exactly when those times were uh, from, from the blueprints and those documents. Um, another thing that helps, I, I alluded to uh, dealer price lists. There are a lot of Gibson dealer price lists still around. Uh, I've collected them for years and years, and they give a pretty good uh, chron chronology of when models came and went. Uh, I, I mentioned the L2 uh, just a minute ago, but uh, other things like uh, uh, the Army Navy model mandolins and, and guitars are in there. There was a, a mandolin called a C1 model that was very, very rare. Gibson only made it for a short time in 1932 uh, and helped me tremendously in dating uh, a piece of factory literature. Um, there's, a, there's a Gibson uh, flyer, uh, a sales flyer called the Road to Happiness. Uh, it was like a fold out thing. And it, as far as I know, is the earliest mention of a flat head type tone ring. Uh, so, you know, it lets us know that that is what Gibson called them. That's not some word that we've made up to describe that kind of Gibson master tone tone ring. That's what they called it at the factory. Well, on that flyer, that road to happiness flyer, they're advertising that C1 mandolin. And, and the other thing is this flyer is not dated. That's right, the flyer's not dated. The price lists were. Right. But uh, so we know that that flyer was from 1932 because that's the only time uh, that the C1 appeared on the dealer price lists, which are dated. So that lets us know that uh, kind of a cool thing, Gibson was calling it a flathead tone ring uh, even as early as 1932. But they actually introduced it earlier. Uh, earlier, yes, yes. And that, that's a whole other topic that we can get into at length. But the uh, point is you have gone through where you have not only shipping ledgers, and serial number ledgers, you have work order numbers, you have ledgers of purchase of supplies. Correct. Uh, not only of wood, but of component parts such as tuners, tailpieces, tone rings. Gibson didn't make their own tone rings. They mm -hmm. subcontracted it. Right. And you know who made them, you know about the history of those companies. At different times. And sure. 
you know, that's where these things are critically important, not only in dating, but also in evaluating instruments, because just sometimes for a tone ring alone, the right Gibson flathead tone ring, just for the tone ring, these days can push $25,000. $30,000 for a gold plate. Absolutely. Another thing that helped uh, to correct the chronology were instruments that turn up once in a while with an original bill of sale. That's awesome. Although it could have sat in the store. It could have sat in the store, but we know that it, it was at least in existence at that point in time. Uh, and for a very few instruments, believe it or not, we have some factory documentation where it was ordered. And we know the exact date that the factory order number was assigned because they assigned it on the date it was ordered. These are custom order instruments. So we have an exact date. Uh, we know that uh, uh, batch 9607 uh, was a custom order on April 13th, 1930, uh, for example. Uh, I'm, I'm making that up, but it's it's similar situation. So every once in a while we have that. Uh, not unlike Martin guitars, where uh, we sometimes find a top that's dated on the underside. Uh, so well, that's typical of the Martins of the late 1800s. Right. And into very early 1900s, but uh, not much beyond extremely early 1900s, and generally right. not much before the 1880s either. Uh, another thing that uh, came about as a result of gathering all this information into one place, um, one of the things that I've done for years, one of the crazy things, is I've kept a serial number list of pre-World War II Gibson instruments. And there are other uh, tens of thousands of instruments now in my list. And where I can, I will note the factory order number uh, alongside the serial number. And you can very easily see that when you put the serial numbers in order, in numerical order, the factory order numbers are no longer in order. And if you put the factory order numbers in order, then the serial numbers are all out of order. Uh, and again, that's explained by the fact that the factory order number was assigned during production. Some of those instruments were completed right away uh, and they got their serial number as they were shipped. So uh, uh, you could have, uh, for instance, say a, a mandola. Uh, mandolas weren't particularly great selling instruments. Uh, mandocellos, those kinds of things. And uh, it's not unusual to look at my serial number list and see a, uh, a say an H2 mandola uh, that was made in 1910, but didn't sell till 1916. Uh, and we can tell that from the difference in the factory order number. And you can system. see the uh, harp guitar in the catalog until well into the thirties when they really don't seem to have made any past 1925. That's right. That's exactly but, right. Uh, they're in the catalog until I think it took them to the late thirties to finally sell out of them. I think so. I think so. Absolutely. And Gibson didn't throw anything out. They didn't waste anything if they could help it. So just because an instrument hadn't sold, they, they held on to it because <laughs> it might sell. And even Martin occasionally had a few things that in their shipping ledger, they would uh, have shipped it new with a comment obsolete model yes absolutely so that, uh, some of those things while the serial number does indicate when it was started occasionally some of those things didn't get shipped right. until much later but usually uh, they were sold quite promptly right. but usually and always is not the same thing uh, and and all of this whether we're talking about martin or gibson or fender or whoever we're talking about, can be thrown into doubt if an instrument went back to the factory and got repaired at a later time. Uh, sometimes we just scratch our heads. Um, and Gibson also had, during the Depression, uh, that they had their incentive for dealers to stay with them, that you could send, if it, if it sat in your store too long and you could send it back, you could trade it for equal value of other items, they would take it back. So that sometimes the same instrument could be shipped out as many as half a dozen times. And sometimes it was sent out with a road rep. And that was also noted. So you, you can right. even point out examples where you can see the same instrument having been shipped out multiple times, multiple times, multiple times. until it finally stuck. That's, that's, that's exactly right. Um, one of the things um, 
I did while I was writing my book was I interviewed uh, ex-employees at Gibson and sometimes their children. Uh, Adrian Glarum was a pre-war Gibson employee that was there for so long, uh, just decades and decades. And his son, Adrian Jr., was still alive at the time I was writing my book uh, and in a great clear mind. And uh, fascinatingly enough, he would take his father's lunch down to the factory on Saturdays and his dad let him hang out in the factory uh, for the rest of the afternoon. And he had fascinating stories to tell about early instruments like uh, harp guitars and, and banjos and things that had been returned on dealer exchange. They were already assembled and then got returned on dealer exchange and then just hung on, on a rack inside the factory and sometimes pushed over into a corner somewhere. Uh, and uh, things that were, were decades old uh, that were still hanging there. Gibson hadn't thrown it away. Uh, and one of the things he would do, um, his dad, Adrian Sr., worked in the repair department. Uh, sometimes his dad would send him out to look for a, an obsolete part, George. Uh, you know, if they had, a, had an early L5 and it needed a tailpiece, well, they didn't have the exact tailpiece anymore. And sometimes Adrian Jr. was sent out to search for an instrument that they might steal a tailpiece off of. So Gibson didn't throw things away, and if they could, they reused them. Well, there's quite a bit of history. And the other thing is, of course, you even have copies of many of the employee files. I do. I do have so, some, some uh, employee information, senior and how they things. survived, sort of like when there were some very hard times that Gibson went through. Absolutely. Certainly uh, 19. 24, 25, that was a tough time for them. Right. I think probably the worst year at Gibson was 1932. Um, uh, they, uh, in December of 31, they let almost a quarter of the workforce go. They laid them off uh, right at Christmas of 31. Uh, and in 32, uh, they, it, was, it was difficult for them. Uh, even today, if we look at uh, production in 1932, we see that most of the instruments are basic instruments, they're entry level things, uh, you know, style one banjos, uh, style double O, L double O guitars, um, things like that, uh, because the workforce had been greatly reduced. Uh, and uh, the probably the experience there to build the the more expensive instruments may not have been there or they may not have thought they could sold them. Uh, so uh, definitely uh, we see, uh, you know, changes. It's also a time when the musical trends were changing so that by 32, the uh, market for the banjos was greatly diminishing, but the market for the archtop guitars actually was increasing with some of the skill, the expertise needed uh, was different. Absolutely. And uh, you know, Gibson started out as primarily a mandolin company and then made guitars too, but mandolins were the dominant thing. Then it went to where banjos in the 20s were very significant, although they still didn't completely quit mandolins or guitars. Uh, but the archtop guitar really came in strong starting in 31, but 32 was a tough year economically. Right. But they still were making some high end guitars. So That's right. I think in looking back at the records, uh, the really, really seriously, the thing that saved the Gibson company uh, was the contract with Montgomery Ward, uh, which started in 1934. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, started in 29. Uh, they started making Recording King and Studio King uh, guitars and banjos, mandolins in 1929 for Montgomery Ward. Uh, and by 1934, uh, that output represented a large percentage of what they made. George, 10, 11, 12% of everything they made in 34 went to Montgomery Ward. Well, Gibson's, so. and look, let's face it, any company that's been in business for 100 years has seen ups and downs. Groom Guitars Incorporated. I haven't been in business for 100, but we've been in business for 51 years. We've been through several recessions and pandemic and numerous challenges. And companies like Gibson, Martin, Fender, they've seen good times and bad. And um, many companies didn't survive that. A lot of the banjo companies did not survive beyond the 30s. 
Uh, they couldn't make the transition from making banjos to making guitars and other things when banjo popularity went down. Gibson was more diversified. Um, Epiphone, really, you know, by, in the mid 50s, Epiphone failed right. and ended up being sold to CMI, Chicago Musical Instrument Company, which was the owner of Gibson at the Gibson. time after uh, CMI acquired Gibson in 44. Uh, but uh, so good times and bad can alternate. So uh, anyway, that's the scoop. Um, I think we've got enough to wrap it up for now. Uh, I would like to also announce that next week, we're going to take a break. And uh, so we'll be back in two weeks on the air with more questions. So please send questions. And uh, I'm still easy to reach in the meantime, george at guitars.com. Joe is joe at grun.com. When we do appraisals, that's Joe and me working together with him doing a lot of the heavy lifting and me proofreading and going through it. So uh, I definitely have input in those appraisals, but um, between Joe and me as a team, we're a whole lot stronger than I would be alone. And Joe brings things to the table that we didn't have prior to that. And I'd like to think that uh, the appraisals are all the better because we do work as a team. I bring something to it as well. And uh, between the two of us, we also know about multiple different manufacturers, each one of which is often a completely different subject to study. And the methodology is not the same because some of these companies don't really have much documentation at all. Like we're doing a Larson Brothers guitar. There's only one existing known catalog of Larson guitars and it doesn't cover the whole line of that they did their entire history. It just covers what they did in the early thirties. So, we have a wealth of research and experience, but we're still learning every day. It's an ongoing process, but we're having a good time at it. We enjoy what we do. We look forward to helping you in the future. In the meantime, we're easy to reach and you know how to get us when you want us. Have a good one. See you next time. Well, Joe, I think it was actually remarkable.